G'day everyone, my name is Nigel Gillen, I'm a veterinarian currently based in Solomon Islands working uh, in Honiara. Uh, I'm here as a mentor, a uh, veterinary mentor with the Australian Volunteers Program placed with the Solomon Islands Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock. Uh, prior to coming over here earlier this year, uh, I worked for about 10 years as a local land services district vet in Mudgee and then Orange. Uh, apologies that I can't be with you in person, but hopefully this recording works okay. Uh, the organisers have asked me to provide just a quick overview of livestock production and health and EAD preparedness in the Pacific context. Uh, so I'll try and give you a bit of a snapshot of livestock production here and particularly how that relates to some of the transboundary disease threats uh, that are of concern, FMD, uh, but also ASF and lumpy skin disease as well. So I'm here with the Australian Volunteers Program that's part of the Australian Aid Portfolio just for a six month assignment. Um, and the focus of my role is really on capacity building, training and mentoring some of the local animal health staff. Uh, there isn't a government veterinary officer employed by the department, but there are some livestock officers who work as paravets. Um, so a lot of my time is spent with them. And uh, the areas that we work on are much the same as a government vet might uh, cover in Australia. So things like livestock disease surveillance, both endemic and exotic diseases, biosecurity, providing advice on production and disease management to local livestock producers. Uh, in the Pacific, it's fair to say that pigs and poultry are by far the most common species that you'll find. Um, there are definitely some reasonable sized cattle industries in some countries, places like Vanuatu or Fiji, and uh, also goats and sheep to a lesser extent in some countries. Uh, of those pig and poultry producers, most are small holders, uh, so um, particularly away from the capital cities in the village kind of context, uh, it will be subsistence farming, um, raising pigs or poultry for um, the consumption of just that village or at a household level perhaps. Uh, closer to the larger towns and cities, there is some small scale commercial farming. Um, for pigs, for example, that might look like, say, 50 sows or 100 sows uh, with poultry, perhaps a 1,000 layers, that kind of scale. So still, for the most part, pretty small, but more intensively managed uh, in a commercial context. Here's a couple of uh, photos of pig production in Solomon Islands. Uh, the one on the left is uh, just outside of a village which is about 50 k's west of Honiara. So this is probably a pretty typical example of uh, small-scale uh, livestock production uh, in a village context. Uh, there was just a couple of pigs, they were tethered there so they could move around a little bit and um, they were being fed what looked like a mix of household vegetable waste and coconuts and that kind of thing, but you can imagine how meat waste from household consumption could pretty easily end up in that as well. Uh, on the right is a larger um, pig farm not far from Honiara. They had about 100 sows. Um, the diet was um, pretty well managed. Uh, husbandry and, and so on was pretty good. Um, so more intensive production style and they were supplying local butchers and restaurants So in many Pacific countries, the local production uh, does not meet demand, sometimes doesn't even come close. So these countries are by and large very dependent on imports of livestock products. Um, in addition, there's often a, a real lack in terms of the supporting industries and infrastructure, so things like feed mills, um, ag supply stores, slaughter facilities, all that supportive um, industry is often lacking as well. So for an example, in Honiara, there's a poultry slaughterhouse, but no slaughter facility for pigs or goats or cattle. All of that would uh, essentially happen on farm. There's often very little access to veterinary services of any kind. Uh, 
Uh, in some countries, mostly the smaller Pacific nations, there won't be any vets at all. Um, often there may be some vets in private practice and a small number of government veterinary offices. In Solomon Islands, for example, there's one vet in, uh, in Honiara running a private clinic, mostly companion animal, but does deal with farmers as well. There hasn't been a government vet here for about the last five years. Uh, once you get outside the capital cities, again, veterinary coverage is, is pretty limited. And so for some of these outlying islands or smaller provinces, their access to veterinary services is uh, minimal to, to nothing really. What that means in most Pacific countries, uh, paravet staff tend to be responsible for lots of the livestock work. Uh, often they're government employees and um, would be looking at things like disease investigations, uh, treatments, um, providing advice on health and disease and production. Uh, it's worth saying that the level of knowledge and skills and experience among those paraventary staff can be highly variable. So in some cases, uh, they might be really well resourced and well equipped to perform a disease investigation, examine animals, perform a necropsy, take samples and so on. Uh, and in some cases, the, the level of expertise is, is a lot lower than that. In addition, there's often very limited access to lab testing. So in some Pacific countries, there might be some basic lab capacity, say, for example, parasitology, maybe a little bit of microbiology, bacteriology, uh, that kind of thing. In Solomon Islands, there's nothing at all. So there's uh, no veterinary lab, no veterinary um, testing capacity of any sort. Uh, and what that means is that things like rapid test kits so field diagnostics become a really useful option. Uh, and yes, they might lack the sensitivity and specificity of a lab-based test, but um, they're a really great resource when that's all you have. And also things like lab technology have been used pretty successfully, uh, for example, in the ASF outbreaks in Timor-Leste. So putting all that together, I guess that means there's a pretty limited local surveillance network uh, perhaps not a lot of staff with not a lot of resources and not a lot of way of getting samples tested um, at a lab. That said though, there's plenty of input from some international partners, so organisations like the World Organisation for Animal Health or FAO are quite active and Australia and New Zealand both have Pacific engagement type programs when it comes to livestock health. So they will have vets in the region from time to time uh, doing things like um, training, um, some uh, disease outbreak simulation exercises, um, helping supply consumables, that kind of thing. So there is support there um, to try and cover some of those gaps that exist in country. Overall, you can see there are some uh, pretty big constraints and challenges when it comes to the provision of veterinary services and just livestock um, production in general. Resources are often lacking. Uh, these countries are often quite isolated. They're dependent on um, freight coming in uh, and any disruption to that can uh, have a big impact, which we saw during uh, the COVID response particularly. Uh, there are some cultural practices and social factors that mean the risk of an incursion of a transboundary disease is genuine. So swill feeding is quite common um, and uh, social factors such as uh, foreign labour uh, with construction camps or logging camps or mining camps, that kind of thing, does mean that there's um, often uh, a level of illegal import of pork products, for example. Uh, the Pacific is a unique context and uh, some of these constraints mean that it simply isn't feasible to always follow the accepted rules. Uh, there's a need to be creative and innovative with uh, preparedness and response to disease incursions. In the Pacific or the Indo-Pacific uh, region currently, as you know, FMD, LSD and ASF are all present in Indonesia. Uh, 
and African swine fever incursions have also occurred in the last few years in both Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea as well. Uh, that bottom left image there is uh, some advisory material from the PNG uh, Ag Department that shows where the ASF outbreak occurred. You can see there it's uh, in the highlands, so not near a, a border area, not near a port or an area where you might expect an incursion perhaps, but that just goes to show um, that surveillance across the entire country, even those areas that are less accessible, is still really important. Uh, and here's the most recent WOA map of uh, the FMD extent you can see there, yet to find its way into the Pacific region, PNG uh, there is still free, and um, Solomon's lies just east of that, and then the uh, remainder of those Pacific islands uh, still free of these three main transboundary diseases that we're concerned about. So transmission pathways, uh, when you think about live animals, uh, most Pacific countries probably have pretty good border biosecurity there. There wouldn't be um, lots of movements of live animals. In the Solomons, there's a little bit of an exception. Uh, out west, there's a very um, close border to Bougainville, which is part of PNG. And uh, we know there are movements of people between those islands and, and may well be some movements of livestock or livestock products along with that. Illegal pork imports are uh, probably much more of a concern. So overseas labour companies, that kind of thing, um, offloading freight uh, away from the main ports where it can't be inspected by bureau by security staff, uh, all uh, creates a pretty big risk um, of virus actually coming into the country and then uh, it you know it doesn't take a lot for that virus then to to find its way into say a pig population particularly when swill feeding is a common practice so thinking about how all this relates to Australia I guess there's a few questions of relevance um, Firstly, how long will it take in one of these countries for an incursion to be first detected and then reported and then confirmed? Um, and I think you can see that the answer to that may well be quite a while, particularly um, in more distant islands, uh, away from the capital cities where there's not as much of a surveillance network. It may well be quite some time before an incursion is um, fully identified. The next question is, well, once it's identified, would it be possible to contain an outbreak? And, um, you know, there are some, obviously, some resource limitations and some pretty big constraints there in terms of staffing and resources. However, the island nature of these countries uh, can be used in our favour to control uh, the spread uh, of transboundary diseases. And so thinking about the forward risk of spread, um, again, perhaps there's um, minimal pathways for forward spread, but still obviously some potential transmission routes. So lessons for home, I think there's uh, a fair bit that we can learn from the experience of those places just to our north that have had the misfortune of being affected by things like FMD and African swine fever. I reckon we can see that transboundary diseases will continue to spread. Um, the risk of school feeding has really been highlighted to me. I think it, it's really proved by countries like PNG and uh, Timor-Leste that school feeding can and will spread diseases like ASF and foot and mouth disease. And what that means is that an index case could occur anywhere. It doesn't have to be at a, in a border region or near a port, for example. Swill feeding means disease can occur anywhere, and that's, um, I think, important to keep in mind for our routine surveillance work. And lastly, uh, we see from these countries' experience that rapid diagnosis, as we always say, can really significantly reduce the ultimate cost and scale of an outbreak. Uh, I think Timor-Leste's experience with ASF proved that. Their first outbreak uh, took a while to be detected and the cost was pretty high. 
the second was picked up much more quickly and was able to be contained far more effectively. Uh, next, I think it's been a good reminder to me to appreciate uh, and use the resources that we have. Uh, it's fair to say Australia has a pretty good veterinary surveillance network, I think. Um, and it's one that's worth, worth supporting and worth strengthening further. Uh, and also good to remember how easy it is in Australia to perform those lab exclusions. I think uh, we should really make use of that opportunity. Uh, it's so simple to send off some samples in a low-risk suspect EAD case. And lastly, good reminder that there are all sorts of opportunities, I think, to support our Pacific neighbours. Uh, plenty of gaps to be closed and plenty of interesting work to be done. Well, hopefully that overview provides you a little bit of uh, context in a, in a regional set. Um, I'd be more than happy to have a chat if you had any questions or wanted to ask anything further about um, the topics that this presentation has covered. So, uh, feel free to reach out at the email address there. Thanks for your time.